The views and opinions expressed on this program are those of the guests appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of 8 News Now or Next Star Media Group. Well, let's talk about uh, one of the big stories here this week. The state filing its expanded lawsuit against opioid manufacturers, distributors, and uh, and the like, just all kind of all sides of the business that they're touching. I think there are more than 40 defendants named. Uh, is this going to solve the problem or, or at least get us in the right direction of solving the opioid problem we're having here in, in our state as part of the national crisis? It's absolutely not a solution, right? I think I think it's it's a step and I think it's a step in the right direction, but nothing's gonna solve this. Look, the further down the rabbit hole we go on this in particular, uh, the the filthier and more disgusting it becomes, right? We we know that Purdue knew exactly what they were doing uh, when, they were, when they were doing this. Uh, the internal communications show that. We're very, very aware of that. Um, so th I think there's a lot of there there, and uh, one single set of lawsuits uh, is is not going to solve this. This this is a nationwide problem, and it's pervasive in the state. Um, you know, I, I I believe now that uh, now that Eaglet Prince has been has been brought on for this particular suit, I believe that makes ten, ten municipalities. Yep. Um, that are that are currently using them to to go after these manufacturers. Um, I think it's necessary, uh, and I think it's important, but I don't think it's a solution. What do you think, Alan? I mean, if if they're successful, they'll get some revenue out of this. But uh, is this the way to attack the problem? Is this one of the only options out there? What do you think? It's not the way to attack the problem. They are doing it for money, and everything they do like this is for money anyway. Uh, I don't think it's going to have a, a any kind of impact on, on the issue at all. First of all, I don't think that lawyers should be telling and politicians should be telling doctors how to practice their their, their trade. Doctors don't go into the uh, the, the courtroom to tell you know the lawyers what to be doing with the next witness on the stand. So I mean I, I'm very firm on that. The uh, the issue of addiction, people dying from uh, opioid addiction or opiates as we used to call it. Uh, is because of street drugs almost entirely. And people going after street drugs because the doctors are limited how much they can actually prescribe to these people. So they get them on it to get rid of the pain, which makes complete sense, and then they have to cut them off. Again, this is a, an insurance issue, it's a, it's a legal issue, and, and, and the problem is people need those pain medications. So they, they seek them out wherever they can get them. If they can't get them legally and they need them, and not only want them, but need them, they're gonna, it's gonna seek it out. And sometimes they buy things like what fentanyl, uh, a dangerous, dangerous drug, uh, and people wind up overdosing from the street drugs uh, way more than they overdose from um, uh, legal, any kind of legal drugs at all. It, it, it's a, they're, it's trying to, to um, it, it's going after a fly with a cannon, and, uh, and, and I, they're not going to solve that problem. I was doing a show some months ago, and I talked about this extensively, and I, w I was asking people about their, their issues that they've had. Some of the people were calling and saying that they have been using uh, opiates or opioids and, and painkillers for years, and it's because of back pains and other types of problems, falls that they've had that where they have chronic pain going on, and they need this to keep going. And they can function, they say, on it as well. It may not be my choice, and I, I'm not going to sit and judge them. Thank God I'm not in their position to say what, what they need to manage their pain. But I think that we've got to be listening to the medical community more instead of just condemning them. And the last thing, that one of the aspects of this lawsuit was, as, as the pharmacies were carrying, they're having too much, uh, uh, too many pills, you know, in their pharmacy and stuff like that. When you come out with a new product, you always take it and you always fill uh, a, a business up with as many as you can so they don't run out. And the idea that they have run out, which I, I've known of in, in the past for other issues, you, you, you don't do that. Leave the pharmacies alone, leave the doctors alone, let them practice what they do best, go back to your courtroom and go after the bad guys. Now I largely agree mm -hmm. with what Alan just said, but what they're doing here is they're going after pill mills, correct? They're going after these doctors that have prescribed many, many hundreds of times over uh, what, what a normal pain management uh, situation would be here. Um, so I, I, again, I largely agree with you on that. Um, I do believe that, that you know, those medical decisions need to be between patients and their doctors, period. Uh, we don't need 
lovely. We don't need um, the fly. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> lovely. Got a cannon. Uh, right, exactly. It's the fly in need of a cannon. Um, however, uh, you know, we we do need to to make sure that we are policing the bad actors here, and I believe that that's what this is about. I, I think the point that Alan brought up as well, kind of tagging off of all that. We have seen here in Nevada, and you see this, the side of the story that's not as much told is, okay, we try to keep it out of the hands of the people who shouldn't have it, but it stays out of the hands of the people who do need it as well. They have a hard time accessing it, and I think that might be an unintended consequence. Is that a fair statement? I think that is uh, a, a very fair statement. And the yeah. issue is, have they overprescribed? You would suggest that. You know what? Again, they're, they're prescribed to people, I think, who need it. Uh, hopefully, you guys aren't. Well, I'm not. Thank God, none of us are in that situation where we need it. Um, but if you need it to be able to manage pain, and you can't manage it any other way, I, I wouldn't say this. How cruel it would be to say to somebody, you can't have it. I'm not a big fan of opiates or or, or drugs. I don't do drugs. I, I'm not into that stuff at all. But you know what? I, I still look at it and say, if somebody needs something, don't keep it away from them. I mean, if somebody needed heroin to manage their pain, I would give them that. So, I mean, I, I'm for medicinal use of these types of drugs. Recreational, no. But medicinal, 100%. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, we've, we've done the grading of the session so far, the grading of the session as soon as it's done, but uh, we, I think, can give that final grade that we're putting in the grade book uh, because we've seen now all of the bills either become law or get vetoed, three were vetoed by the governor. Um, now that it's all over, uh, does your grade change? Let's put it like that. What, what, what do you think the grade should be and has that changed from what you thought? Yeah, I'd, I'd give the governor a, a solid B plus to A minus, right? I'm a, I'm a pretty harsh uh, grading rubric over here. Um, so, you know, some disappointments, sure. Um, but for, for his first round uh, in the executive um, with a, a largely new legislature as well, um, I think he did an exceptional job. There's always room for improvement, clearly. Um, but no, I, I think he did just fine. How about you? What, has your uh, opinion changed at all in the last couple of weeks? Yeah, pretty much. I, I give him a C uh, because I don't think he deserves more than that. I, I, he and his staff, I don't think, uh, were together from the beginning. We've talked about this before regarding the staff of the, the governor and the staff of the, uh, the school superintendent. I, they have not been together. They have not dealt with some of these issues. I know he made promises in a state of the state speech about the pay raise and all the other ones not going to raise taxes, and that's questionable whether he raised taxes or extended taxes. But, um, but but the point was, I don't think that he thought a lot of the specifics out before the state of the state speech. And once he got up there with his staff, who were all fairly new, I mean, they were trying to figure out what do we do now. And you know you, you can't figure out what you do now. It's like you know be, taking over the driving of a car when you never had any lessons. You better you know get that lesson ahead of time and figure out you know where the brake is, where the the gear shift, and all the other things are. You don't wait until you're in the middle of a of a freeway going 65 to go now. What do I do? I, so I mean I, I just think that you know he, he did okay. Um, he, they did not you know get past this, this gun issue about lo local ish municipalities or whatever uh, regulating their own gun laws. That was good. Um, uh, again, it was, a, it was a mediocre session. Nothing to write home about. Okay, and I think C was the grade you gave it before, so you held firm on that C. All right, this has been the controversial topic this week, I think, at the national level. Um, AOC calling the facilities where the migrants uh, are, are being held at the border uh, she's liking them to concentration camps. I, I promise both you'll both get to talk about it. I'll, I'll get let you get your answers out. Um, is that does that kind of rhetoric get in the way? I'm not even going to I think ask whether or not you should condemn her or not, but does that get in the way of actually getting to a solution, ratcheting up the rhetoric? What do you think? Absolutely not. No, I don't think. Uh, look, at the end of the day. The situation does not need to rise to Auschwitz or Dachau levels in order to be a concentration camp, okay? We've done this in America in the past. We've called them internment camps. We did that to, to German and uh, Japanese. Japanese folks in this country. Um, and those were concentration camps too. By definition, any time that you are rounding up people deemed undesirable, and collecting them together and centralizing them, that's a concentration camp. Um, and I think it's, it's time to demystify 
uh, you know, this image that that somehow, you know, concentration camps uh, merely sprouted up, uh, you know, ex nihilo with with crematoria and and you know gassing and all of that. That's not where it starts, right? That is that is absolutely not where it starts. And so the fact that you know we're we're deeply concerned with this rhetoric right now, I think does a disservice to the reality because in reality, by definition, these are concentration camps. You can call them cupcake factories if you want, but that doesn't change the truth. Of course, Alan, you could respond to that, but I also want the context of um, does the rhetoric get in the way of fixing the problem? Uh, yes, it definitely does, because uh, first of all, you have Nancy Pelosi and the rest of the Democrats condemning the people who condemned AOC. Uh, so uh, they refuse to condemn any of the anti-Semitism and any of the overt hate that comes from their own side. Uh, Omar, Len Omar, and all these with their anti-Semitic statements and all, they won't, they'll couch it in, 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 in terms of bigotry around other types of issues. Uh, these, uh, the Democrats are cowards. They're absolute cowards. Uh, listen, they were the ones who uh, created the KKK, and now you know they are on the road to actually promoting as much anti-Semitism as possible. They're refusing to to condemn uh, AOC, and they're uh, because they're afraid of her, and they're afraid of the these new um, uh, little young fascists who are coming to power in the uh, in the Democrat Party. First of all, let's be very very clear. Concent the, the, the term of concentration camp was not used before the Nazis used it. Internment camp we had in this country for, for Japanese, not defending that either, by the way, other forms of incarceration that we've had for various purposes for various types of people. Uh, this is not a forerunner of, a, of a, an extermination center. The purpose of the concentration camps, the definition, everybody knows this too, the purpose of a concentration camp in Nazi Germany was a forced labor and was to uh, be able to prepare for mass extermination. Mass extermination. Everyone knows that. What is going on here are people coming uh, illegally into this country, being held, and then they should be deported immediately. What happened in Nazi Germany with concentration camps, it was not anything to do with people illegally breaking into the country. As a matter of fact, they were trying to get the hell out of Dodge because they were going to be killed and they knew it. So these are the people they are holding until they could exterminate them on a mass basis. Um, AOC knows this. She either knows it, and she's either ignorant of history and ignorant of the use of history or um, she is purposely doing this to get a rise out of people. I can tell you that just this morning, the, um, the Holocaust Museum in Auschwitz actually condemned this themselves. They said you cannot compare what is going on in the holding centers in the United States, in the south part of the United States, to concentration camps. You want to call them holding centers? If you want to condemn them, uh, you, can, uh, you can talk a lot about immigration, but you cannot call them concentration camps. Listen, this is not going to fix the problem the problem it exacerbates people's uh, emotions that's all it does how does it fix the problem i mean you want comprehensive immigration reform sit down and work out the issues but don't sit there and tell me that it's a concentration camp and hurl names and all the other things because we're not going to be able to start at a at, at a ground zero to, at least to try to fix the problem and, um, and I don't know if we're going to fix the problem uh, until perhaps uh, Donald Trump's halfway through second term. I have no idea. Well, Mike, and the point is, okay, so you talk about putting that aside, trying to find a solution sitting right. down. Well, okay, there was the Gang of Eight bill back in 13, I believe, 2013. Mm -hmm. But really, uh, other than that, we haven't done that yet. Is there any hope that that would happen, whether or not we're talking about this issue itself? Oh no, absolutely not. That's there is no no way to move forward right now, right? We are in an absolute gridlock in Washington. You will see absolutely no positive change on this, without a doubt. It's a centerpiece of of the president's reelection strategy. Uh, it is not a coincidence that uh, the ICE deportations were were announced the morning of his campaign kickoff rally. Um, so no, there's, there is no chance for progress right now. However, we do move the ball forward by telling the truth and calling it like it is. These are concentration camps, period. Do you think that there's any appetite to move forward at all on immigration reform in a bipartisan manner? 
Not in the part of the Democrat Party, there's not. Uh, not under this president. No, absolutely not. They didn't do it under Obama, for that matter, either. And so uh, I, I'm not sure that there is. One, one more thing I'd like to say, uh, in, in the concentration camps, uh, what were truly concentration camps in Nazi Germany, the mad scientists performed uh, mad experimentations, horrid, horrid experimentations on human beings. We don't do that. We don't do that. We, we, we try to help these people uh, when they come here ill, and they, they come here bringing Ebola and other types of diseases. We try to actually help them out, uh, and, then, and then what we do is we release them into society with a promise that they'll appear in a court in whatever, 20 or 30 days, whatever it is, and then 90% of them don't appear. They don't appear, and they're running around this country without any kind of tag, so to speak. So what we're doing in holding centers, comparing it to the, the, the madness of concentration camps, is a disservice. That kind of language is not going to, um, is not going to uh, get people talking at all. You're not going to get people talking. Republicans want to deal with this issue. But we have things that we think are important to, to, to talk about. Democrats have things they think are talk about, but they're not willing to listen to the Republicans. Republicans have said already, in many cases, they're willing to talk about dreamers and, and, and all the other things. Re Democrats have said they're not, they don't want to discuss anything that the, uh, the Republicans do. A wall, you know, anything like that, that's off the table. Republicans are going, well, we'll talk about dreamers and other things, but let's talk about the things we want. No, we can't talk about what the Republicans want, but here's what we want. If you want to do what we want, we'll call it, you know, getting together on this. And, and, and Democrats are, are not willing to do it, especially under this president. They wouldn't do it under Obama. They won't do it under this president. And then if we have a President Pence or Nikki Haley, they're not going to do it under them either. Let's talk about the uh, first Democratic debate coming up in the in this upcoming week. So it's, of course, with so many players in the field, it's going to be a, a two night extravaganza. Um, if you want to pick a winner, I mean, I don't know at this point if you want to, because everybody's going to talk for about seven seconds. But still, uh, who has who has the biggest chance to maybe come out of the shadows into the spotlight and shine and who has the most to lose? Honestly, it, this thing being spread over two nights is an absolute joke. And and it's a, a master stroke of snatching victory from the jaws of defeat or sorry, uh, snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. You can't you can't run. Uh, your your party this way and you can't run your debates this way. It makes you look clownish. So, uh, you know, uh, do I think anybody is going to win here? I don't know. Um, honestly, at this point, you know, my position as a wet paper bag is going to be better than, than the Republican nominee. So uh, there is that. But uh, aside from that, the, the Democratic Party looks clownish here. So their reputation, perhaps, is what they have to lose. It's I don't I don't or know that anybody sort. even expects anything else at this point. Um, you know, it's it's very much like the the cavalcade of absurdity that we saw in in 2016 on the Republican side. It's it's really not any different. You got to winnow your field down. You got to narrow it. Well, I, I think uh, so. Mike says pretty much everything to lose, nothing to gain. What do you think? Uh, I've never seen a bigger uh, clown car of candidates in the Democrat Party than they have this year. None of these people are qualified to be president of the United States. None of them at all. Uh, and and I, and I know uh, Pocahontas gets up there and she says, I got a plan. I've got a plan for everything. I, I got a plan. This woman's insane. She's really, really, uh, I think maybe clinically, they ought to look at her. Uh, very, very strange. Uh, and by the way, during the reparations discussion, she said, we've got to include Native Americans in reparations too. Uh, and this woman is absolutely insane. These candidates uh, are going to make fools of themselves. The winner in this, uh, the debates, I'm going to predict it right now. And it's Donald Trump because he's going to tweet about everything going on and his tweeting, everything he's doing, that's going to capture people's imagination, make them laugh. He's going to come out and attack them one by one, we'll just like he laugh. did, just like he did with the, with, the, with the Republicans. He did the same thing. You're right, in 2016, you, know, you had all the candidates up there. A lot of them had no business. Jeb Bush had no business being up there. So he you know, talked about you know, a Sleepy Jeb or whatever the names he gave to each one. He knew how to do that. There's no Democrat right now that is of that kind of uh, stature that, that Trump had or that has that, uh, the cojones that, that Trump had to go on that stage and start attacking them one at a time. That's what, what Trump did. He'd pick one off, this one, and this one would talk. 
He'd pick him off too. He had a name for each one of these people. There's no Democrat right now that is outstanding. Biden, I know, is ahead a little bit, but you know he's been saying some things, and then he backsteps, uh, backpedals from things. I mean, you know, this guy has n no no right to be up there at all. And and you got Pocahontas, and you've got uh, Spartacus, and all these other people out there. I'm telling you. Trump is going to have a blast tweeting, and he's the winner. Donald Trump is the winner in these debates and in 2020 for election, a re-election for president. And that means America loses. No, we win. Oh, my God. We oh, win. No. Big time. Well, Anytime Trump's on the keyboard, America oh my. loses. Well, at that point, I'm getting picked off right now. We're up against a time <laughs> wall, but both of you guys, thanks for coming in this week. Thank you. Thank you.